why don't we hop over to the workshop? We've pulled some capsules, and we can always do more after after our session finishes up. What I want to go over with you all is a very, a very nice method. If you are a dungeon master, to plot the setting for your game. And this is presuming that you're not playing something like Tomb of Annihilation, which comes with its own. Or even if it is, how could you modify the setting to better suit your characters uh, for, uh, for whom you're running? Now, you may recall at the end of last week's workshop, or by the end of the workshop, we had randomly generated four, uh, four characters. And going into this week's workshop, the presumption is... We're dungeon masters. We're going to be we're going to be running a game for our friends. Our friends made characters and they handed those characters over to us. So presumably they are passionate about those characters that they want to play. Last night, we went over techniques so that you as the dungeon master can uh, in different ways through text or visual uh, through visualization, you can see the the party. And uh, and you know where you would like to go, what you would like to do with it. We went through a couple exercises, a SWAT report, um a oh you're gonna run Princess of the Apocalypse. Oh I, I hope you have a lot of fun with it, uh Popo Potatoes. We went over, also, how can you link them not just through mechanics, how can you link them through who they are, through their backgrounds, or a, a quick abbreviation of the characters to find connections. As well, we also went through and said, all right, based on each of the character sheets, what are some prompts that we can draw? All right, coffee. Have a great night. Thank you for uh, thank you for talking with us. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, thank you for revealing you're one of those rare belly sleepers. And uh, it's Ewe time, says Raven. And uh, we'll see you around. And from each of the characters, what are some prompts that we can draw to help? explore the setting to help flesh out the setting uh to help them enjoy themselves and immerse themselves in the story that we want to run for them and we did just that we we went through each of the four characters and they revealed to us things that would exist in the setting that would mold or shape them or that the player of that character would find intriguing or would somehow like to engage with in the future or already has. We're going to use this as a base of reference as we go through a randomized settlement concept, or at least partially randomized. As I think there are going to be things that are that we can lock in and it's not like we're really giving anything away because they already were randomized and it's super de duper fits uh what all what all's going on. I'll BRB for a minute or two to quickly get a new drink. We'll still be listening since you're using your wireless headphones. All right, Hark. So we may have random elements, and so I'll call on you in chat to roll uh to help us generate this using the Dungeon Master's Guide, keeping it nice and simple. We're going to take the results of those random rolls and we will... Let's let's make a, a, a fleshed out setting that is going to be organic to the characters. The characters will have come from the setting because the setting has come from the characters. If we know our, our friends in the meta want to play these characters, these characters exist. They have been raised in different ways to exist as we meet them. They are fixed points in space and time when we start the story. Thereby, we have a solid foundation upon which we can build 
the setting, NPCs, villains, and so forth. Okay, Samus. Yep, uh, you're welcome back whenever, whenever you can make it. And Chris, same for you. If you crack open your Dungeon Master's Guides... Oh, that's on the player's handbook. That's right. Uh, we normally start with terrain types. And this is arbitrary. I like starting with two different terrain types. It gives you some good variety. And it's not like, you know, <laughs> Ferris with a PH. Ferris Bueller. Welcome. Thank you so much for the follow. You know, it's not that, you know, you can't have a little a little forest in the middle of a desert. And, and if you roll Desert Mountain, that you can't have trees. However, I like having at least two, two biomes that are side by side to give a little bit of variance to our, to our terrain, to our area. And normally, we would roll a D8 twice in order to determine our two biomes. Because there are mechanics that are intrinsically tied to the eight biomes over here through Circle of the Land Druids and through Rangers. And then we can interpret the biome. You know, a desert doesn't have to be so, uh, hot Sahara. A uh, desert is simply a dry place. You can have Arctic deserts as well. Hey, English Mudkip, good morning to you. Now, as we have a Ranger in the party... Why not allow the ranger to use his or her abilities? And the ranger actually had two different types, and that was forest and swamp, because we did roll randomly for those. A forest and swamp. And this is where the... It doesn't have to mean the whole adventure takes place there. This is where the majority of the setting, or at least the, the grounding, the start of things are going to go. And where we travel from there, we'll see. Welcome back, Hark. So we don't need to roll here. We finished with the player's handbook. Now, we are going to go... We're going to go to the, uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide here. In broad concept, the form of government, it was referred to as an evil tyrant. Now, it doesn't have to be necessarily an evil king or, or something along those lines. It's simply the leader, whoever she or he is, is acting in a tyrannical method. Hey, Gamus, and hello, Raz. Raz, there's two dice sets left in those uh, 17 capsules and a $20 prize goblin, too. Where we can begin and we can get our first roll. Uh, Tobias, will you please type exclamation point 1D100 in chat and let us know what type of government run uh, is, uh, is uh, existing in these lands. 23. <laughs> well, a dictatorship... You know, we're talking about an evil tyrant, and a, and a dictatorship is a very easy example of such. One supreme ruler that holds absolute authority, but his or her rule isn't necessarily dynastic. In other respects, this resembles an autocracy. In the Greyhawk campaign setting, a half-demon named Eus is the director of a conquered land that bears his name. It writes itself, right, Hark? So our form of government is a dictatorship. Also, when I'm gen now with, again, when I am generating terrain, in addition to the two biomes, the the two environments that are predominant. Again, you can sprinkle in other other things too. Chris, uh, Chris Air, you're new here. 
Uh, and you will learn, as Hark has demonstrated, there's a saying that very eerily fits most of everything we do that says it writes itself. For many of us, we might be scared to be a DM or pull our hair out in fits, trying to think of ways to, you know, stories and all this other, all this other planning. If you give things a chance and let them fall where they will, the story will write itself for you. All you have to do is be the gentle hand that guides it. I like, I like having three unique features, at least three unique features, whether we're talking a city, three, are we talking a county or an equivalent if you live outside the U.S.? Or, or uh, also in one or two states, they're parishes instead of counties. Three unique things. Uh, scale it this way. Can you think of three unique things in your city? What about three unique things that define your county? What about three unique things that define your state? What about three unique things that define your country? And no matter which scale we're making a setting, we can we can take prompts and add two monuments, two monuments and a weird locale, something kind of supernatural. Now, if you want to play a low magic setting, make it three monuments, make it no monuments. You already have them pre-planned. For the purposes of the workshop and getting our minds uh, to exercise and expand, we're going to leave this out to chance. Uh, so, Chris, will you please type exclamation point 2D20 to give us our two monuments? One and five. So our first monument is a sealed burial mound or pyramid. Okay. In fact, we can even refine it and choose one. But first things first. And number five, an intact obelisk etched with a warning, historical lore, dedication, or religious iconography. So uh, I'm going to put an intact obelisk etched with. Raz, will you please roll a d4 in chat to determine what is etched on this obelisk or other, you know, mono uh, uh, monolithic monument? Stops on a two. Uh, a historical lore. Now let's determine, do we have a burial mound or a pyramid? Oh, sheeps, can you please roll a D6? One, two, three is a burial mound. Four, five, six is a pyramid. All right, we have a sealed burial mound. And we also have somewhere in the region an intact obelisk etched with historical lore. Well, O Sheeps, I'm sure, has huge tracts of land. Uh, and so you can admire, you can admire uh, those mounds for days, Tobias. Now, what about the weird locale? What is something... What is something that's perhaps a, perhaps a little supernatural, huh? A little bit, a little bit odd, a little bit weird, huh? Van, will you please roll one d twenty in chat to determine what's an interesting, what's kind of a a weird place in this region? Stops on a 15. A haunted hill or barrow mound. Now, this begs the question, do we actually have two mounds and one of them has been breached? 
Or is the sealed burial mound perhaps leaking and this is causing some disruptions? Mounds for the win, says Tobias. A haunted hill. And you know what? I guess we'll ask the question, do we want a, a haunted hill? Or do we want specifically, you know, is it a hill that is seemingly natural, but like a ghost haunts there or something? Or is it a barrow mound, which was specifically, you know, made to cover graves? Uh, Hark, will you please roll a D10 in chat? If it's odds, it's a haunted hill, like, uh, you know, betrayal at house on the hill. Or if it's evens, we have a barrow mound. Odds. We have a haunted hill. All right. Now, this is another place where we can take a look. We can take a look at what has been submitted to us. We had two gnomes and a halfling. And then we had this aquatic half-elf, which could be the product of a human and an elf. Or we could treat half-elves, or specifically aquatic half-elves, as uh, its own unique race that isn't a blend of others. I think we have information enough where, you know, if three of our party members are, are short stacks, then perhaps, uh, perhaps at least the dominant or minority race would end up being, you know, the halflings or gnomes. And if we only have the one of, now the one of doesn't, doesn't mean that this half elf race uh, you know, doesn't exist. Of course, you could have a population of a hundred of them. And you're like, well, cool. That sounds like a big population. Then if the city's a hundred thousand, suddenly, you know, it's actually just a couple families uh, that live here. So what you can do, if you'd like, is to roll randomly or to draw on, to draw on what your players have given you, especially in fifth edition, your players' character sheets do so much work for you as a dungeon master. And if we want to make dominant uh, dominant halfling or gnome, we can do so. Or if we want to say that really all you know all the short stack races, maybe in this campaign setting, um, you know, gnomes and halflings are are pretty much the same. They're just, you know, they just, they all consider themselves cousins. They're all sort of derivatives of each other in, in some way. In which case that could leave a slot open. Or maybe they're all of a minority population and the dominant race is uh, lizard folk and um, tabaxi. Or, you know, if we had Eberron, it could be, it could be a, 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 the dominant race are Warforged. Now, dominant doesn't mean that they're that they're necessarily the population is the highest. It could just mean they have the political power, that they have the knowledge base, or that somehow they're they're a dominant decision maker by some some measure. I suppose what we can do then, since we have two gnomes, a halfling, and a half elf. And remember, we even said that the half-elf could just be considered to be like a mutated halfling. You know, maybe it's normal to be short, and the tall folk are the weird ones. Because we said maybe he took a dip in some in some waters. Kind of like a, almost like a Ranma one-half kind of a thing. Um, and so we actually have a short race that sometimes, hey, they just grow big. Something happened. You know, some people are albino, some people are colorblind. Some people are unfortunately born to be freakishly tall, like five or six feet tall. And their society has made uh, special accommodations for people with special needs and handicaps who suffer from, uh, you know, from giantism. With that in mind, which could be a fun approach, you know, where you're looking at the person who's like five, five as, you know, they're, 
they're the ones who stand out in a world where everyone is, you know, two and a half to three and a half feet tall. Between halflings and gnomes, then, they may be cousins, but, you know, there, there could be a little bit more of one than the other. Or, whoop, dwarves with gigantic, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, hey, those are uh, those are Duragar, right? They they have it built in. It's just that they can turn theirs on and off. So let's do this, um, Big Sam. I would like you to roll a D eight in chat with exclamation point one D eight. If it's odds, halflings are the dominant race. If it's evens, gnomes are the dominant race. Odds. Uh, so, yeah, so in, in this case, because we're changing our, our um, expectation and our the way that we express things, for those who are six feet, five, six feet tall, you know, obviously you're not a halfling then at, at that point. Um, you would be normal. What would you want to call, you know, so it, you're, you're not a halfling, you are just whatever. Heck, halflings are humans, gnomes are elves. Call your, you know, call your... Use that terminology. Everyone who's like three feet tall is a human. But there's those pointy-eared... There's those pointy-eared three-foot-tall people who can see in the dark. And those are elves. And when you realize how close that is between halflings, humans, gnomes, and elves... Now, what do we call... What would we call someone who's twice that, that height then? If we call halflings halflings because they're reduced, are they called twicelings? Are they called, um, I don't know, twofers? <laughs> they're half giants. They're half giants if they're five, six foot, uh, six foot tall. They're called normies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, like like diseases are named after those who uh, find and research them. Uh, apparently, apparently, uh, a, a gnome named Norm uh, discovered, you know, was a, a real like chronicler for people who suffered from this disease. And now everyone who's like five or six feet tall are called normies <laughs> because they're they're of norm. <laughs> Normlings. <laughs> Sired, yeah. Normlings. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of like that. <laughs> so you have, I mean, halflings, but really, right, humans, or an equivalent, and gnomes that are really elves, and then you get the tall folk, and the the biggins, the 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 tigos. Um. Uh, so then you get normlings. <laughs> and so we'll make a special note here. Um, any who have mutated to be, you know, cause, cause how we consider, uh, what here in the U S I think you have to be four foot 11 as a, as an adult to be considered, uh, to have dwarfism or something along those lines. Or if not dwarfism, then just like a kind of a just a medical what would be the what would be the right word? Uh anyway, so any of mutated to be uh taller than four foot six inches tall are normlings. Hey Victor, welcome. Oh, is it four nine? I I don't know. I it's four foot something. It's four foot something, Big Sam. Uh, in order to be sort of medically diagnosed as a um, as a short person. Uh, to to whatever degree, whether it's a handicap or it's just uh, you have to have a, a particular uh, 
medical exam because it could stress your heart or something along those lines. All right. Now, what about how how do our how do our humans and elves in a classic fantasy setting get along with each other? Well, to find out, why don't we roll a d20? Uh, frag out. Will you please roll a d20 in chat? We'll find out, Big Sam. It's exclamation point 1D20. Stops on a 9. They live in harmony. Okay. Now, the ruler status... This, this is where you can make the decision as you have a very strong backing from the, uh, from the information on the character sheets that we're dealing with an evil tyrant. I mean, we do have a dictatorship. Of course, you could have a benevolent dictator. In fact, there are some economic models, at least when you're studying economics or some other theories that have a, you know, a beneficent dictator as... Um, as a presumption. And it's not that they, you know, that all dictators have to be evil. Um, in this case, though, there's a strong sentiment that there is evil afoot. That said, also, when we were building story prompts from our characters, it's not necessarily the, it's not necessarily the dictator that could be evil, but the people who are pulling the strings. Or something along those lines. Welcome back, Samus. Uh, Victor says, you know, Maddie, I was going to write a Hyborian Ainge setting from RPG, and then I noticed that Conan the Barbarian won't be public domain before 20... Oh, wow. So, yeah, there's a... Uh, th that does have some time left on it. Wow, is it really that long? Huh. Well, it'll be here soon. Let's determine the ruler's status, or at least as the majority of people believe the ruler to be. Samus Gaming, can you please type exclamation point one, the letter D is in doggo, and then 20, exclamation point one D 20. Stops on a one. Oh. Respected, fair, and just. Or is that just the public perception? Or again, if we didn't already have those prompts from our sheets and we wanted to start here, which you absolutely can, you can have a respected dictator. Someone who took power but rules responsibly in the context of what our players in this sort of meta role play have determined, the tyrant has the reputation of being respected, fair, and just, though it seems as if you peel back the curtain, you're going to find some machinations at work. And of course, that's the that'll be the point of the adventure that we make. Well, Pravda is the truth, Frag Out. And I know because the newspaper told me and the newspaper is run by the state, and the state wouldn't lie because the state is made from people like you and me. Why would I lie to myself? Empire Concepts, good evening to you. Respect doesn't necessarily have to come from a good place, though if people are, uh, are scared. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh no, frag out. I was for people for people who don't know what Pravda is. I was uh I was playing I was playing into it. Come on, I thought we were comrades here, frag out. 
Benevolent dictatorship is a required precursor to Marxist communism. Might be interesting. Also, nice critical fail. You know what? We could be set during a time of revolution or revolution to come. Now, what is a notable trait? What is a notable trait about the region we're going to be adventuring? But witchcraft, can I get a d20 roll from you, please? Exclamation point one d20. And I would like you to tell me what is something notable about our adventure setting. Stops on a two. There's a massive statue or monument. And we can stop and ask ourselves, is this new? Is this old? Does it have anything to do with the obelisk that's etched with historical lore? Well, yeah, I mean, someone had to erect that massive statue, oh sheeps. Is it new? Is it old? Or, you know, as, uh, as Popo Potatoes was indicating, what if that's a sign of things to come? What if the statue is new? And even, you know, hey, do we want to explore Animal Farm? All our all our PCs have animals. <laughs> Here we have the barn with the commandments. And interestingly enough, someone just erected a large statue in front of it that seems to block the knowledge. Now the knowledge is still there. It you know, it hasn't been scraped away or changed. It's just that it's in a very, you know, it's in a very observable place now. It just happens to block the view of the historical lore. The obelisk activates. Ooh, we could have a new or old connection between the obelisk and the statue. You know, these are all prompts. Let your imagination wander. Make connections where you're finding them. As you know the characters, as you know the setting. Actually, as we're revealing the setting step by step. Now, this area, this area is known for something. And what is this area known for? Um, Big Sam, I don't think I've called on you to make a roll yet, did I? Uh, Big Sam, can you please roll 1d20 in chat? Oh, uh, you did once? All right, never, hang on then. I, I want to give uh, uh, 12 for 10. You just walked in. You get homework. Haha, <laughs> that's what you get. 12 for 10 cents. Can you please type exclamation point 1d20? All right, Samus, I'll look for the message about that. Stops on a seven. This place is known for hordes of beggars. Apparently this region is the place to come where people are seeking tribute. Maybe they've heard this respected fair and just ruler, this uh, dictator, you know, wants to bring equality to the working people. Wants to bring you know, equal wages for everyone is painting a very rosy picture of this society. And it worked, you know? I hear on paper it works really well. Uh, or in application, you know, you know, people pretend to work because they're pretended to be paid. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, have a great one, 12 for 10. Thanks for helping us out with the setting. Now, what about the... There's a current calamity going on. And the calamity would even be above and beyond or associated to the Haunted Hill, the Beggars, uh, or any of this other stuff. Maybe the mutants, all these normlings that are starting to, to come around could be a part of it. And what is the calamity that is visiting our settlement? Uh, who has not rolled yet? 
Victor. Actually, hang on, Victor. Empire Concepts is new here. Empire Concepts, will you help me out and type exclamation point 1D20 in chat? Empire Concepts, exclamation point 1D20, please. Stops on a 16. Oh my goodness. There's internal strife that leads to anarchy? Hark. I, I need an Ewe here. We ha Thank you. We, have p we already have player characters that before we did anything with the setting, were trying to bring down the dictatorship from the inside. This... It writes it... Everyone, it writes itself. It writes itself. If any of you have ever agonized over being a DM and wondering about your setting, your characters, the adventure you're going to run, it writes itself. Oh my gosh. Internal strife leads to anarchy. Hi, Afterfav. Afterfav, I need you to I need you to make a die roll, please. Maybe it's a dictator tot. <laughs> well, the dictator would presumably be a, uh, a halfling or gnome, which would be a human or elf. Um, or the dictator could be... The dictator could be a normling. Ooh. All right, after Fav. We have some awesome prompts for our setting. However... Do we have a prominent religious building of some variety? Do we have a prominent religious building of some variety here? Now, it's not that several... I mean, look, I live in a city of 25,000 people. And there is... I mean, you go downtown and there's a church on every corner. And I'm talking like, you know, 100-year-old limestone, you know, limestone churches kind of a thing. Doesn't mean that there there are there can't be more than one faith or one building of faith. This might be a more recognizable. If you go to Paris, you better believe there's a lot of churches and cathedrals, but you're probably gonna want to at least visit the famous one. In this case, um, I would like you to give us what, what is our Notre Dame, or what is a relevant place that is gonna be a part of the setting, whether or not our players know it yet or not. And so I need you, uh, after Fav, to roll a D20 in chat. Exclamation point, one D20. It could be after Fav. Let's find out. Stops on a 17. So we have a, so it's um, a prominent religious building, which could even be interfaith or... Or uh, or even agnostic, where uh, it's a library, but you can find there are religious uh, books on religion or even some services held there. But we have a library dedicated to religious study. Now that could also mean if it is uh, if it's kind of a universal place of study. Uh, it could even be an extension of some kind of a, a faith or faiths uh, way to uh, have like a seminary. That could mean you might be able to find some forbidden, some some no-no books there. And considering we have both a fiend warlock and a celestial warlock, this would absolutely be a prominent place where at least those two would go. And again, it writes itself. A random number absolutely confirms and supports two of our four party members as those party members were randomly rolled. Don't you mean a church of Owo? Popo Potatoes? 
ID yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, there could be a lot of meetings. I, I mean, look at look at how faith has led to upheaval in society. Look how uh, it might be an example common to many of us. It's not exclusive. Look at early Christianity and how it was considered to be a weird cult. You know, people would meet each other in each other's houses. Uh, they would have uh, these clay tokens that would be broken in half. And to kind of prove that you were a part of the club, you know, you put one half of your of your clay tablet to the other to make the symbol. And if it matched, you both knew secretly, you know, that you're on the winning team, uh, you know, back then for that consideration. Um, or you could also have, uh, I mean, you could have, uh, you could have that the anarchy would even be something like a reformation. We might have an orthodoxy of some kind. And and if we're going to lead to anarchy or rebellion, someone's got to go to that church door and pound that list into it. Someone's got to stop printing Bibles in Latin and put it into German. You know, someone needs to step up. There you go, after Fav. I've heard of the band, but I can't say I'm familiar with the song, but witchcraft. Well, is it, Hark? I'll tell you what. Oh, sheeps. Oh, sheeps, will you... Uh, will you do me the pleasure? Right. Oh, snap. We're getting, uh, we're, we're getting a, a raid here. Grouch Couch Games. Welcome. Everyone in Matty Morgs, uh, spam your, your love and your emotes and your hype. To Grouch Couch Games. Grouch Couch, what all were you up to before raiding us? You want to talk about what was going on in, on your channel? Spooky Sprinkles, hello. TT2KB, uh, thank you for the, the raid emotes. Oh, you're playing Jackbox? Yeah, cool. Which party games were you playing through? That's something that we do time and again here as well. Oh, I love... All, look at all those cool emotes. I love it. Oh, look at that wizard emote, Spooky. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, I, I want to thank all of you who came over from playing Jackbox games with Grouch Couch to Matty Morgs here. Willie the Wizard. Kingfishy, hello. Oh, look, I like that hair. Yeah, gr hey, Grouch Couch. All right, oh sheeps, this might be dedicated to you here, but I, I want to give I want to give the role to Grouch Couch. Grouch Couch, thank you for the raid and for everyone who came along with you. Grouch Couch, will you do me a favor? I need I need the name for the tavern in our setting. And it's not that it's going to be the only tavern in the setting, but I want to know the place that is, it, you know, this is the rocking place. This is where everyone in town knows that they need to go to get things. And to produce that name, I need you to type exclamation point 2D20. The number 2, the letter D is in doggo, 20 into chat. Exclamation point 2D20. And, uh, and thank you all for the follows. Stops on 14 and 2. So Grouch Couch says that the, the place to be in our setting is the Frowning Dolphin. The Frowning Dolphin. Now, we stop here and we ask, okay, Frowning Dolphin... Why is it called as such? Is it because this uh, this city, this area, is is coastal? Is it because uh, the person who established it, uh, maybe he just had a longer nose or she, and and was kind of a and was kind of well grouchy. You know, 
the frowning dolphin, the grouchy porpoise, whatever, you know. Or maybe there's even a, 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 you know, the seat of honor in the frowning dolphin is called the grouch couch. A sad fisherman runs the bar. Barkeep lost his wife in a horrible dolphin accident. Hey, that can happen. We'll keep it PG-13, but that can happen. Um, or it maybe it's just something that gets the attention of everyone. Because a oh, because a breaching dolphin looks like a frown when it's yeah, because it, it. And so and so actually, you know, while we say frowning, maybe in this culture's context, a frowning dolphin is is kind of a uh, an ironic statement because uh the dol the dolphins are frowning when they're having fun and so you know when when it's breaching when it's jumping it it you know it looks like a frown that could be a unique in-game euphemism we're building a culture and we're using language you know we're using our language we're applying our language differently just as our dominant race and minority race are uh are halflings and gnomes but we're calling them humans and elves because this is the normal. Anyone who's taller than four foot six, they're normlings. Something, they're mutants. Something happened to actually make them freakishly tall. Not like civil folk that are between two and a half and three and a half feet high. You know, we humans and elves. No, no, no. There's all these normlings that have been born a lot recently. Hmm. Uh, Spooky Sprinkles, the dolphin was mounted above the bar and fell on his wife. Oh, no. But you, see, there's a story in a simple tavern name. There's a story to tell. A call, Look at this. We've just created an expression. We've created a story, whether it's true or not, or everyone has a story about how the frowning dolphin got his name. And the proprietor probably doesn't like that most of them involve his wife. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you, Grouch Couch. Now, what is the style of the tavern? What is the style of the tavern? Uh, Spooky Sprinkles, will you please type exclamation point 1D20 in chat to tell us what kind of a, what kind of a tavern is our main tavern here? Sixteen. Okay, so it caters to a specific race or guild. The frowning dolphin caters to a specific race or guild. Now, what that could mean? No normlings allowed. It's only for us normal humans and elves. Halflings and gnomes. Or. Or, or or beggars uh yeah it, it could be uh it could be people of a certain uh main or mean depending on how you want to pronounce it m e i n not like chow main or something uh, people of a certain mean cannot get into the frowning dolphin you know in demolition man in the future you know so you had to be a, a person of note to be to eat at taco bell Caters only to dolphins. <laughs> oh, TT says, ah, well, wouldn't that be interesting, TT? Because there is some brewing internal strife, as we've determined it, as we're building our settlement. And what if the frowning dolphin is the place where the po folk gather to whisper gather to plan gather to raise their cups for what will happen soon tavern style um caters to 
Um, not I like not to beggars per se, but um, caters to those who have friends in low places. <laughs> Where the, uh, where the whiskey runs and the beer chases the blues away, and you'll be okay. Now, I ain't big on social graces. <laughs> I got friends in low places. <laughs> Yeah, maybe the bartender's name is Garth. Look, if you're creating an adventure for your friends, have little inserts like that. It's it's okay to explain that there is a human halfling named Garth behind the counter, and Garth is known for, you know, wearing some impressive boots and a matching hat. <laughs> Rianu Keeves. <laughs> In my story, I love switching letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grouch Couch, that is a tried and true method. It absolutely is. I can't unsee a dolphin bartender wearing a cowboy hat cleaning a glass. <laughs> you gotta wonder, Spooky Sprinkles, after the glass is clean... Is that actually the, the cloth on the glass, or is it the dolphin talking to you? You had kickless, kickless nage. <laughs> Gotta head to bed. Good to catch you again. Yeah, TT, good to see you back. Thank you so much. Oh, it's both? Is he talking to himself? <laughs> It'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the thunder rolled yeah <laughs> you gotta get out of the water when that happens and the lightning strikes <laughs> he'll have a really big comeback concert in a public park as well uh, <laughs> alright now this isn't normally on the setting sheet but you know what we had a lot of fun with it last time Rastus, it has been a while. Welcome back. The dolphin was the coat of arms to a fallen family. Hence the frowning... And, oh, and we can tie this in. Because the one normling in the party... There's only one normling in the party? Was, or is a what? Do any of you remember? What is the normling in the party? Oh, sheeps, don't go just yet. Don't go just yet. I, I, there's one more thing I need you. I need you to do. No, not the courtier. Oh, sheeps. We have the other... We have the rival tavern. We have the other place. It may not be the place... But this is another place. Oh, sheeps, I would like you to roll 2d20 in chat to give us the rival tavern name. Yes, the chum bucket to our crusty crab. Three and one. The staggering eel. I mean, if this is an aquatic... You gotta go... That's fine, Rastus. Thanks for stopping in and saying hi. And by the way, everyone, if you're new here, we have an expression... We have an expression in this channel called It Writes Itself, or Iwi. You know how you have your oh woes and your oo woos Here we have Iwis. It Writes Itself. 
one of the party members is a, a uh, half-elf that is an aquatic half-elf. That's the normling in the party, is we have two halflings and a gnome. And we're treating the half-elf, because there's only one, right? We have, we are, we're dominated by, th you know, three feet tall people. Here, one of the PCs was accursed with a, a mutation that made him, like, five foot five. So, oh, a freak among his people. Oh, oh, oh. That boy ain't right. And it's an aquatic elf. We have now the frowning dolphin and the rival staggering eel. We certainly are going to be incorporating water. Water will play, and especially salt water, I think, will have a a heavy uh, a heavy bearing in the setting. We have forest, we have swamp. And you'll see what we can do with that. Make the witchcraft roll the the theme. Hey, f well, I you know I, I I wanted to give the the name to you, sheeps, because uh, you're you're going, and I appreciate you modding. Phi Saris. Phi, will you please roll one d twenty to let us know what kind of tavern uh, is the staggering eel? You're a mer barmaiden. Stops on a nine. The staggering eel is a raucous dive. Now, we all know what dive means in the sense. Dive is, is you know, is that, you know, you got friends in even lower places. What if we take that with the theme we've been building? What if the staggering eel is actually underwater? What if you actually do take a dive of sorts to get to the staggering eel? But witchcraft, it writes itself. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Mwah. Molto bene. How long are you going to stream for tonight? Well, it's almost three, Samus. Um, we have our setting. And, uh, and really, uh, I think we're going to get up and take a break. A pool, uh, it's a pool sidebar, says Raz. You know, oh, so I guess you're missing out on all the cabana boys, oh, sheeps. We'll take a break, and when we come back, with the power of MS Paint, yes, MS Paint, why don't we map out this region to further act as inspiration and organization for all of the ideas we've had so far. The Samus, yeah, Samus says it's literally the chum bucket to the Krusty Krab. The staggering eel underwater would be the perfect place to launch an anarchist revolution. Ooh. Or that's where our, our secret power behind the throne meets. Something along those lines. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Tobias Knight, you're going to head to bed? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, get to bed. Uh, thank you for hanging out with us, Tobias. And Popo Potatoes, you got to go, too? Thank you all for sticking around for the workshop. And uh, and I mean, you'll see what we end up drawing, because uh, we're going to draw on it uh, later when or tomorrow when we do our NPCs and our villains. <laughs> all right. Let's come back in about 10 minutes, everyone, all right? Take a, a snack, a drink, use the restroom, um, you know, do what you got to do. And when we come back, I'll have MS Paint fired up and with a mouse and limited art skill, I'm going to show you how you can make some awesome RP maps with MS Paint. <laughs> 